Yes. You may be seated. Good to be with you this morning. Welcome our campuses as well. Do not adjust your screens. My jacket actually looks this way. We've we got the Arrowhead campus, that's downtown. And Medford, Oregon. Wow. Wow. How y'all doing? Anyway, glad you're here. Uh, today. For those who don't know much about me, I'm a little bit different than most relationship speakers in America today. Most relationship speakers have PhDs. Dr. So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so and have ABCDEFGs behind their name. I don't have any of that. The only initials behind my name are PR, which stands for Puerto Rican. <laughs> You're like, Puerto Rican? Gunger, what, what kind of name is it? Gunger, Puerto Rico. Actually, I was born a Rodriguez, along with every other person on that island. Yes, they're everywhere. Uh, but when I was very young, my parents got a divorce because they could not agree. My father wanted to have girlfriends. My mother could not agree. So it was a communication problem. She got rid of him, remarried a man by the name of Gunger, hence the name changed. But I was not born on the island of Puerto Rico, La Isla del Encanto. Pastor Mark, you were born in Puerto Rico? Yeah. You like serious Puerto Rico. That's good. No, I wasn't born on the island of Puerto Rico. I was born on the island of Manhattan. So I am a New York Rican. It's kind of like a Puerto Rican, but different. Anyway. Say, so, well, you know, by the way, that's, that's one of the big things. Everybody wants to know their heritage, their DNA heritage. You ever take these little tests? They're kind of fun. So, so I did one because I'm bored. And... Uh, uh, it came back and said I was 20% black, which makes sense on that island. All the slaves and Spaniards got together for fellowship and made the rest of us. So I, so I went to all my black friends and said, look, man, I'm part black. They said, we figured that out already. I said, how do you know that? I said, look at the way you dress. <laughs> then I went to the doctor and got a physical comes back and says, you know, your estrogen levels are really high. What? Not only am I part black, I'm part woman. <laughs> My wife says, you're getting grumpy. Of course I'm getting grumpy. I'm turning into an angry black woman. Leave me alone, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> so if you're not a PhD, then what's your background? How can you talk about marriage? What makes you an expert? Because I've been married. <laughs> That's pretty much it. I've had the privilege of being married to two wonderful women, not at the same time. First one, I was married for 45 years to a little redhead by the name of Debbie. She passed away a few years ago and have remarried now to a beautiful blonde by the name of Deanna. I don't know if the cameras can catch her, don't worry about it, but Deanna, everybody that's here so they can stand up and see who you are. So there's my late wife, Debbie, and now my late wife, Deanna, uh, she's still alive. She's just always late. Anyway, so from this, from this I share. Now, what I want to share with you today is going to be a little bit different. You know, the Bible says, seek after wisdom. Everybody says wisdom. Wisdom, see? Uh, James said, if you don't know what to do, ask God for wisdom. But we don't want wisdom. We want God to tell us what to do. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. That's what we do. We're supposed to ask, seek after wisdom. There's not always a quick path to it. So just practical, down-to-earth information is what I want to share with you. If you like lots of verses and a lot of shouting and hallelujah, and we all like that, today's going to be a little different. This is, I'm just going to try and show you how to succeed with another human being in this thing called marriage. And whether you're married or not, uh, this can help you in any relationship. And it's, how many of y'all are single? Yeah, that's good. Y'all need to be here. You need to know about crazy before you get there. All right? So you can listen to that. So, but I do have a Bible verse I want to share with you. And uh, how many like the Bible? You don't you love the word? Yeah. yeah. I have found the perfect Bible verse for marriage. That if you follow the advice from this one Bible verse, you will never, ever, ever have a problem in marriage. 100% guaranteed. Check this verse out.
It is good for man not to marry. You say, where is that? This is from 1 Corinthians, the 7th chapter. You can look it up yourself. People say, well, that, that's horrible. Why would the Bible say that? Because he goes on to explain that he who marries will have trouble in this life. People come up to me, Pastor, there's something terribly wrong. What is it? We got trouble in our marriage. I go, no, that's, that's about right. That's about right. Bible's trying to warn you. You don't pay attention. I tell people all the time, look, the reality is what your spouse does may very well irritate you until the day you die. The good news is you die. No, no, pastor, the problem is not, we're not compatible. We're not compatible. Compatible. People don't even know what words mean today. You know, 100 years ago, they say the average American had a vocabulary of 50,000 words. Just read some of the writings from 100 years ago. It's stunning. There's words you won't even know what they mean. This was the common American. Today, now, the average American has a vocabulary of 5,000 words. It's one of the reasons people have such a hard time communicating with each other. They literally lack the vocabulary to explain what they mean. If you can't find the right emoji, nobody knows what you're talking about. <laughs> At this rate, we're gonna turn into cavemen. Hallelujah, picture, picture. The word compatible does not mean two people who agree about everything and feel the same about everything. That's not compatible. There's a different word for that. Delusional. <laughs> the word compatible actually comes from the Latin word Compati, you can Google it as I speak and you'll see that's where it comes from. And the word compati, you'll see on your little Google screen there, is literally translated to, to suffer with. <laughs> that's what it means to be compatible. Yeah, y'all a lot more compatible than you thought. <laughs> now a lot of people don't know this, but the relationship between a husband and wife is fundamentally a psychological relationship. It is a psychological relationship. You see, one of you is a psycho. <laughs> and the other one is logical. <laughs> and for some reason, psycho and logical are always hooking up. <laughs> and we're going to try to figure out this morning which one is which. I love this verse in the Bible. Proverbs. Where no oxen are, the manger is clean. Let me explain to you what that means. What it means is if you have an ox, you're going to have ox poo. Now, if you don't like poo, and most people are not big fans of poo, the temptation is get rid of the ox. If we just get rid of the ox, we get rid of the problem. Seems to make sense, but then you run into the second part of the verse that says this, but much increase, benefit, profit, comes from the strength of the ox. Well, no, there's the catch-22, you see. Everybody likes the benefit of the ox, but nobody likes the poo that goes along with it. And what he's trying to say is you cannot have one without the other. There is no such thing as a poo-free marriage. Now, if all you get out of your marriage is poo, then you have one sick ox. And I can help you with that. But this morning's little talk is not how to get to a state of perfection in your marriage. This is just about how to get to a good positive to poo ratio. For those of you not very spiritual, I have a mathematical version that might help you out. But it's all about the ratio. You want more positive than poo. Nobody gets perfection. I know everybody thinks they're going to get perfection. Nobody comes to the altar thinking, this is going to be, I'll never have another problem in your. Boy, yeah, you will. We try and warn you. Nobody listens to us, by the way, Pastor. We warn you before you get married, but you're in a delusional state. <laughs> And it turns to, ah! So I want to give you some practical wisdom. How for a husband and wife to get along and to understand each other. Now we're going to, guys are going to bring out a couple of chairs here. And I have a volunteer couple that's going to make their way to the stage. Wherever they are. Here they come. Give them a hand. Hello, dear. How are you? You're adorable. You can have a seat. You're not nearly as adorable, but you can see over there. <laughs> I want to talk to you 
about how men and women think differently. Here's the problem. We don't think the same. And we have these differences that, listen, every argument in marriage boils down to one very simple argument. Why can't you be more like me, right? Clearly I am brilliant and you are mentally ill. But these differences are so exciting in the beginning and they draw us to each other like a slow moving car wreck. And then we get married and we drive each other crazy. And we don't understand why the other one does what he or she does and then you get mad. Why? Because the sinful nature in us immediately goes to the dark side. Why does he act like that? Because he hates me. He's a jerk. Why does she act that way? Because she's a witch. No, they're just different. Now I'm going to share with you what are basic stereotypes. I don't have a cow about the stereotypes. I'm not saying everybody's this way, but they typically tend to be this way. There's always exceptions. Part of the fun of this little exercise we're going to do is see how you stack up against the stereotypes. That's all it is. And there's always exceptions. There's exceptions in my marriage. When I first started studying this stuff, it disturbed me. I thought, oh man, I'm a woman. But everybody's different. I will say this, that if in a certain area, a man thinks and acts more than typically a woman would think, take it to the bank. In that area, his wife will think and act more like a man would typically think. We almost never find people who think the same. And then we give bad reasons for the difference. No, it's just we're different. Let's try to understand each other. My goal in my ministry, actually, and those of you who are studying the book, Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage, I don't try to change people. Now, some people, I understand we need Christian change and God, but, but my book, my approach is simply, I don't try to change anybody. I just try to get people to understand each other. Because if you can understand why somebody does what they do, it changes everything, even though it doesn't change anything. And it, and it takes away the anger and the frustration. It's called wisdom. Everybody say wisdom. All right, so we're going to just talk in stereotypes, okay? For example, a typical stereotype would be you know, men are more interested in sex than their wives. Why would you say that? Because generally it's true, but it's not always true. There's lots of relationships where it's the wife who's much more interested in sex than her husband. If you're here this morning, you happen to be in a relationship where your wife is much more interested in sex than you. I think I speak for all the men here when I say that. We hate you. Please do not share. All right, here we go. Men's brains, women's brains. We will begin with the man's brains. Now, ladies, men's brains are made up of little boxes. And we have a box for everything. It's what we do. We compartmentalize life. We have a box for the house. We have a box for the kids. We have a box for the money. We have a box for you. We have a bo box for, the, for your mother somewhere in the basement. And, <laughs> and, and the rule is the box is... Do not touch. Ladies, when a man discusses a particular subject, he goes to the appropriate box. He slides it out. He opens it up. He will freely discuss the contents of that particular box. And when he is, yes, amen from the men. And, and then when he's finished, he will fold it up and put it away, being ever so careful not to touch nor disturb any of the other boxes because the boxes do not touch. Then we have the female brain. Now the female brain is very different. You see, the female brain is made up of a big ball of wire. <laughs> and it's like the internet where everything is connected to everything. And the house is connected to the kids and the kids are connected to the money. The money's connected to your mother and she jumps from one thing to the other. La, 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 la. And she does, because to her, everything is fair game at any given moment. Of course, her husband's listening to her going, what box are you in, man? I don't understand, I don't understand this. What, what are you, are you, you keep changing subjects. I don't understand. And, 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 and she is convinced that he will get it. That he will learn to connect. But ladies, we do not connect. If you want something from a man, for the love of heaven, just say it!
Come on, boys, give me a hua. That's a man's amen right there. Here's an example. A man is driving the car down the freeway. His lovely wife says, say, would you like to stop and get some coffee? And he goes, uh, no, I'm good, thanks. And he keeps driving. <laughs> 10 minutes later, he looks over to her and, wow, what? What's wrong with you? You didn't stop for coffee. You didn't say you wanted coffee. You asked me if I wanted coffee. But we failed to connect. Now we men have a box in our brains that most women are completely unaware of. This particular box has nothing in it. In fact, we call it the nothing box. And of all the boxes a man has in his brains, ladies, our nothing box is our favorite box. If a man has the opportunity, he'll go to his nothing box every time. This is why a man can do something seemingly completely brain dead for hours on end. Like fishing. So why a man can sit in front of a TV set and go. <laughs> this drives our wives nuts. Stop that. You can't possibly be watching anything. I'm not. Go away. Now they actually measured this. University of Pennsylvania several years ago did a big study on brain activity. They were the ones that discovered that in point of fact, men have the ability to think about absolutely nothing and still breathe. But conversely, they discovered that a woman's brain never stops. They brought women in, wired them all up, monitored their brain activity. They brought in the men, wired them up. In fact, listen to me. They said up to 70% of a man's brain activity completely shuts down when he's relaxing. You see, when a man is chilling out, we're chilling out. If a woman tells you she's chilling out, she's just cold. And she doesn't understand the nothing box. In fact, there's nothing quite as irritating to a woman than to witness a man doing nothing. How can you just sit there? Huh? Women don't understand the nothing box. A woman will witness a man in that glorious vegetative state. And she'll come up to him. So, uh, what you thinking about? Nothing. We got to be thinking about something. They'll ask and they'll get mad. They'll actually get angry when they ask, what are you thinking? And he says, nothing. They think that we are withholding from them some deep emotional truth. There's nothing there. Leave him alone. He doesn't care. No, he's just nothing there. Go away. This also affects the way men and women talk. Now they say that if a man needs to use 10,000 words in a day, a woman needs to use 20,000 words in a day. My wife says, well, that's because we got to repeat everything we say. (laughs) 
To which I responded, what? <laughs> Not only do men and women use different amounts of words, words themselves can have total different meanings to men and women. For example, five minutes. Now to most men, five minutes means five minutes. To a lot of women, it's an indefinite period of time. Are you ready yet? Five, five minutes! Now as we've already shared, men love, cherish, and appreciate nothing. Women don't understand nothing. If a woman tells you it's nothing, <laughs> it's something. Yeah. What's wrong? Nothing? Look out. Okay. Now this next word is not actually spoken. We'll put it in parentheses. But it's a sigh. <sighs> now when a man sighs, it means everything is good with life. Todo es muy bien. When a woman sighs, it means you are an idiot. Go ahead. Now, when a man says go ahead, he's being polite. When a woman says, go ahead, that's a dare. Yeah. And it's true. And you have to be very careful with how you proceed because it will most likely be followed by a sigh which will lead to an argument about nothing. And then you won't have sex again for at least five minutes. Men's brains, women's brains. Also affects the way that we listen. Now women accuse men of having selective listening. You know what that is? That's when a woman will say something like this. Honey, go to the store, lay down the mulch, wash and wax the car, get the kids at school, run some videos, and finish the rest of the dishes. And then he runs that through his filter, and in fact, what he hears is... <laughs> but, but that's not what I'm talking about. I don't think it's so much a matter of selective listening as it is, and what I point out is the difference between men and women, single tasking versus multitasking. Now these are generalities, but they're generalities because they're generally true. Generally speaking, men are single taskers. We tend to do one thing at a time, and usually in sequential order. It actually helps men. It's one of the reasons that men can succeed very much in their career and business is because of their ability to focus on one task, perfect that task, knock out all the distractions. He is a single tasker. Women tend to be multitaskers. And they juggled many things at once and it can be in any order. And they have jobs where they can do that. Even when a woman is at home relaxing, she can be watching television, talking on the phone, and reading a book all at the same time. And, and, and know where her three children are and what they're doing at any given moment. Yeah. Whereas a man is just vaguely aware there are some little people walking around. Now this is reflected physically in how our eyes function. Some of these correlations are really rather fascinating. You see ladies, men's eyes are designed like mini binoculars. Perfect for the hunting and the gathering that we've done throughout the ages. 
But like binoculars, unless a man's eyes fall right on what he's looking for, he cannot see it. <laughs> Women's eyes are like wide angle lenses and very prone to picking up details and they notice details everywhere. This is why a man can walk into the kitchen, open a cupboard and go, And you'll notice when he moves his head, he moves his head like a lizard. <laughs> because of the binoculars. <laughs> hey, where's the salt? And she says, it's right in front of your face. I, I, I can't see it. And then she comes over and as if by voodoo magic, pulls it out of thin air. It's right here. So this affects the listening. What ladies do not understand about men. Ladies, escúchame. Listen, when a man is doing something, Generally speaking, as a single tasker, he doesn't hear jack squat. If a man is doing something, ladies, don't be giving him vital information because he is not going to hear you. And then you're going to get mad as a hornet because you told him. And even if he does tend to listen, Women are such multitaskers, they tend to keep doing whatever they were doing while they talk. And it often carries them to other parts of the house. I remember watching my wife, I'm looking at her, she's talking to me, and she goes down the hall, goes into the room, another room, upstairs, down, drives the Walmart back, whatever! And then she says, I told you! No, you didn't. Yes, I did! And off to the races we go. <laughs> The woman was convincing me I was going deaf. True story. And by the way, talk to any audiologist. Do we have any audiologists in the crowd? Is there? One way back there, yeah. Is it not true how many men come to see you because their wives force them? Because they think they're deaf. They tell me all the time, it's very funny. It's great for them, they keep making money. So anyway, I go to the audiologist. I go to the doctor. My regular doctor, he says, what's the problem? I said, I think I'm losing my hearing. He says, well, you're getting up there in years. You know, ears are one of the first things to go. I thought, well, as long as that's one of the first. You can laugh, it's okay. God knows all about it. Yeah. So I go to the doctor, he says, well, well go with the nurse and, and, and she'll test your ears. So I go to this nurse, she gets this whatever, piece of instrument. Well, she puts on some cheap headphones on me and says, turn around and raise your hands. Every time you hear the beep, raise your hand. I said, okay. So I'm like, beep, 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 beep. I turn around, she says, you can hear all that? I said, yeah. She said, this thing must be broken. You can hear what cats and dogs can hear. She says, I'm going to send you the specialist where they have the real special equipment. I go to the specialist. Actually, the <laughs> name of the place was Eye and Ear Associates. The nurse calls the doctor, Eye and Ear Associates. That was in Green Bay. We just moved there. Never heard of them before. She says, they got an opening for you right away. Great. So she takes a doctor's pad and write down Eye, Ear, and abbreviates Associates. Hands it to me. said, uh, what kind of doctor is this? She said, why do you ask? I said, I've heard of eye, ear, and throat. I've never heard of this combination. She said, let me see that. Oh, I'm so sorry. The associates. Went, oh, okay. I was going to be in for a very uncomfortable test there for a minute. So I go to the next place. Perfect hearing. <laughs> I come home. My wife said, you just don't pay attention. But I've been paying attention. And I've been watching her walking all over the place. 
See, a lot of times women say, they, they communicate, but all they know is that they said something. Just because you said it doesn't mean he heard it, particularly if you're wandering aimlessly throughout the house. I shared the story at a men's conference and all these men start going. At the break, I had all kinds of guys come up to me. Man, pastor, you know what you're talking about? My wife will be kneeling in front of the dryer talking to me and stick her head in the dryer. <laughs> Better pay attention. You're being big trouble if you don't forget this. <laughs> and I mean it. What? Another guy comes up to me. You know, pastor, I'll be in the toilet. The door is closed. The fan is on. And <laughs> she's still talking to me. <laughs> oh, you know what I forgot to tell you? This idea that men can't see things. The first Christmas, the blonde and I are together. She decides she wants to buy me a special gift. Because I've always wanted to have a pinball machine. Not, not a video game. I'm talking the big yo mama like they used to have in the arcades. So she finds one totally restored. And they're big. And she has it delivered to the house and they stick it in a corner and throw blankets on it. For two weeks, I never saw it. <laughs> I walked past it multiple times a day. Every couple of days she'd say, look at me. What? You know what you're getting for Christmas, don't you? How could I know? How could I possibly know what you're giving me? She says, not possible. I said, woman, you're crazy. So Christmas morning was the big reveal. She videotaped it. You have not seen that. Mark, look at me. Look at me. Have you not seen this? <laughs> you have walked by this thing every day, multiple times. How did you get this down here? I didn't. It's got here when we were in Vegas. <laughs> Who brought it? And you would not you have not noticed this big thing. How could you not notice this? I have issues. I have issues. <laughs> Mark, how can you not notice this? Oh my God. I'm serious, I thought you'd notice this. This is amazing. You're out of your mind. <laughs> Apparently, I have issues. Give these two a hand. Thank you very, very much. Bless you, darling. Thank you. Look, if you can start to understand why people do what they do, it changes everything, even though it doesn't change a single thing. It is fascinating. Oftentimes, I'll do a conference and women say, oh, I can't wait till you change my husband. <laughs> I'm not trying to change your husband. I'm trying to get you to understand your husband. People don't understand it. And I know a lot of you are doing this book, Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage. The entire book, I show in great detail the differences between men and women. I show you the studies that back you up. I show you the scriptures that back it up. And while every relationship book in the world has a chapter on sex, I have six. <laughs> it's all, I said, well, Pastor, what if, what if I don't agree with what you're saying? Then you're like my wife. I don't care. I'm not that insecure. I'm not trying to force anybody to agree with anything. At a minimum, just talk it through. What do you think he says about here? I think he's crazy. Yeah, I'm not sure. I have no problem with that at all. But you know what it gets you doing? Talking to each other. If this isn't the way you think, explain how you do think. And communication starts to come. And the bitterness and anger starts to subside. And you realize... He doesn't hate you. He's just different than you. Men, men are not women. They're just not. Get over it. We'll be fine. Say, but I want to chat. We don't like to chat. 
Please don't make us chat. I don't want to chat. What do I do? Get some girlfriends. Then you can spend all day chatting. Chatter away. But one of the things we have to do is we have to stop creating unrealistic expectations. And I have to tell you, the church has been very bad about this for many decades. We are trying to help, but oftentimes create more problems than we are helping. We overdo it. We create such this idealistic Nirvana's type state in marriage. No, it's not that way. It's not heaven. And, 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 and you're not married forever, by the way. Oh, so we're married for eternity. No. Jesus said there's no marriage in heaven. It's one of the reasons they call it heaven. Look, I'm a big fan. I just signed up for round two, but this is not heaven. Relax a little bit and stop with the, the, the perfect analogies and all this stuff. And here's and how, how many of you know the Bible says a man should be the spiritual leader of the home? How many? Yeah, that's wrong. It's wrong. Some of you are shocked right now hearing that. Do you know the Bible never says that? You find me where the Bible says the man is the spiritual leader who's supposed to be more spiritual and Pastor Marker will give you a check for $10,000. <laughs> I had one lady come up to her, I have it right here. I get $10,000. Oh well, yeah, let me see. It says the man is the head. I said, where does it say he's supposed to be more spiritual? She goes, Stop. Don't say more. Who is or who is not more spiritual? You don't control that. I know women get mad and criticize their husbands because they're not more spiritual. And here's the absurd thing. The minute you criticize someone else for not being as spiritual as you, you are no longer spiritual. Well, that's what I thought. I know because you listen to too many Christian radio programs. Stop reading all these books. And by the way, when somebody says the Bible says something, go and read it for yourself. I don't care who you are. Some of you are going to be checking me out. <laughs> what did he say? I can't find Stop. Pastor, pastor, my husband's not handling the finances. He doesn't want to handle the finances. He's not being the man. Who says a man's supposed to handle the finances? Look, if you can handle money and your husband can't, you know, add. Maybe you should do it. But he's ahead, he's ahead. What does that mean? It means he's responsible at the end of the day. You know who's the head of this country right now? The president of the United States, all right? Now, whether him or the one before or all those before them, the president is always the dumbest man in the room. Who do you think knows more about military matters when he walks in the room, the president or his military advisors? Military advisors. You don't hear them saying, well, I think it's inappropriate. He's supposed to be the head. How come I know more about it than he does? <laughs> Who do you think knows more about financial situations, his financial advisors or the president? The president's always the dumbest guy. It's true. He doesn't know nearly as much as the people who are advising him. But at the end of the day, who's responsible? The president! You see the military, I ain't going to that meeting. He should put, he's, the, he's the president, he should know the military matters. I, I ain't going to that. The president, he, he, he should know the financial matter. He's the president! Stop this! Just enjoy each other. You say, my husband's not perfect. Look in the mirror! Oh, and the latest one that just irritates. Oh, just fries my Puerto Rican pancakes. I don't even know what that means. Spiritual intimacy. Couples should reach for spiritual intimacy. Now, I've been serving God for 50 years. I've traveled all over the world. Every version of preaching, prophesying, teaching I've done. Smuggled Bibles in a communist country at risk of being thrown into jail. 
and I have no idea what they're talking about. I mean, spiritual intimacy. What does that even mean? Oh, yeah, let's add something else so you can be more upset. Apparently, emotional and sexual intimacy is so easy, let's add spiritual. These guys need to stop it. You know what marriage is? It's putting up with each other. It's cleaning the toilet, paying the bills, going to church, raising your kids so they're not possessed of the devil. I say, well, uh, I'm not happy like I think I should be happy. Maybe your thinking's off. You know, I was being focused, you know, focus on the family, great organization, you know, they're one of these, they tend to over-spiritualize things. I was being interviewed by this lady, he said, Pastor, uh, don't you believe men should meet all the, spirit, all the emotional needs of their wives? I said, no. She went, what? But she was mortified because they're giving me the standard line, right? I'm supposed to say yes. I said, are you crazy? There's not a man on the world designed to meet all the emotional needs of a woman. And you tell him that, and then the poor guy's sitting there, and she sticks a straw in his brain and starts to suck the life out of him. <laughs> talk to me! Talk to me! <laughs> Stop! And you single girls, if you're miserable, stay single! I'm a minute 30 over. Forgive me of my transgressions. But I can't leave this one alone. You think a man is going to make you happy? <laughs> He's going to try your patience to the edge of eternity. You know what makes a great marriage? Two people who are already happy. If you need someone else to make you happy, stay single. And this is why singles don't invite me to speak at their groups. <laughs> they, don't, they don't like me at all. Seriously. Married people get it. I feel your pain. Single people, they're just... Quit smoking that stuff. I, I gotta stop, right? I gotta stop. I, I gotta stop. I, gotta, I don't wanna stop because I got another hour I could go on this subject alone.